Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jim Rogers, Chairman, President, and CEO of Duke Energy. Thank you all very much. Andrew, I really appreciate your thoughts on international access. I, too, believe that bringing electricity to the 1.3 billion people in the world is a very important mission and one that we in the power sector in the developed world should focus on, finance, and help make happen across around the world. Good afternoon. I am really delighted to be here. Uh, this panel is going to be about technology. And we're going to talk about technology as a game changer. We're going to look to the future in our, in the power sector and say, how does it change the game? Will it change the regulatory model? Will it change our, our business model? And I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. I'd like to thank IEE and the Edison Foundation for having me here today and having this panel. Because a lot of this change is coming, not everybody's ready for it. I don't know if the industry is ready for it. I'm not, e and I know the regulators are not yet ready for it, but it's coming. And the winners in the utility sector are going to be the ones that see around the corner, see the change, and adopt them. The winners also are going to be the ones that work with the regulators to help them understand the changes that are coming and how they can create an environment where we can harness these technologies for our customer. So I think this is going to be a good discussion going forward. Let me briefly set the stage to give you a little bit my point of view with respect to this. Let's think about where we are. If you look out on the horizon, it's easy to see disruptive technological changes coming on both the supply side and the demand side. The way I like to talk about it is the disintermediation of a utility on the supply side and demand side. If you look at solar on the rooftop, you look at CHP, waste energy, all of those, uh, the technologies are evolving. Solar panels, the holy grail was a dollar a watt. It's 60 cent a watt day, and there's visibility to be 40 cents a watt. Cost of uh, installation is coming down. So you can see clearly how that's going to play a more dominant role in the future. But it has a knock-on effect, because there's people that can afford to put solar on the rooftop. With net metering in 43 states, the lost revenues find themselves to others on the system, and this is not a good answer for those in the low income and middle income areas because they start picking those costs up, which raises a, a critical rate design issue. So it's going to happen on the supply side. The only question is how fast. On the demand side, with improved, tougher, more stringent appliance standards, building standards, lighting standards, you already see the demand start to fall. And actually, I'm, I'm going to make a provocative statement. In the 60s, for every 1% growth in demand of GDP, there was a 5% growth in the demand for electricity. In the 90s, for every 1% growth in GDP, there was a 1% growth in the demand for electricity. Today, it's roughly four-tenths of a percent growth in electricity for every 1% growth in GDP. I envision a period in the near term where there's a decoupling of the growth in GDP and the growth in the demand for electricity. And, and that's even with assuming electric cars, that's assuming greater electrification of our economy, but because of the technologies that are evolving, the productivity gains in the use of electricity. Just walk back through that hall and look at the different technologies, whether it's Pulse Energy, whether it's Think Eco, whether it's Internoc. Just walk, just think about them. 
For those group, our company has looked at over 700 different technologies, our CTO has, and these technologies are evolving and they're gonna make some fundamental changes. The other thing that's gonna change everything is the shell gas revolution. Who would have guessed? It's had the greatest impact in our industry. Who would have guessed that you'd be dispatching combined cycle gas units right after your nuclear unit? Never happened in the history of our industry. Who would have guessed that we today would be sitting here where our carbon emissions is at a 1992 level and on per capita basis, 1960 level, and that's all due to shale gas. That is about innovation, technology, and using a government-developed technology for a different purpose to allow for the independent producers, not the majors, to be able to identify shale gas a mile to two miles below the surface. So shale gas has been transformative. But the two dynamics you're gonna see in our industry that are gonna play into this technological revolution is flat to low growth, to, to low load growth. If you were bearish, you'd say declining. And the rise in prices. If you own nuclear, you see greater and greater cost as the units get older. You see Fukushima costs coming. If you own coal, you see increased regulations on coal, greater capital expenditures. If you have a grid, you're, you're converting from analog to digital. And that there's a cost structure associated with that, even though you'd be more reliable as a consequence of it going forward. So there's great change coming, and that's what our group is here to talk about. So let me um, introduce our two panelists and I ask them to come up here uh, as I introduce them. Mike Balhoff is managing partner at Balhoff and Williams, which provides financial and regulatory consulting and advisory services to companies, investors, and policymakers in the energy industry. Mike brings a great perspective. He previously led the telecommunications equity research group at Leg Mason and was named an all-star analyst six times by the Wall Street Journal. He understands what happened in the telecom industry and what the implications may well be for our industry because their technology fundamentally changed the value proposition and the business model there. Next, I'd like to introduce Ron Benz. He's a principal at a public policy consulting. They specialize in energy and telecommunication economics and policy. Ron is a former chairman of the Colorado Public Utilities Commission and also directed the Colorado Office of Consumer Council, the state's utility consumer advocate. So Ron and I actually started at the same place, maybe not exactly at the same place, but we both started as consumer advocates. And I find it interesting that we're here. What to happened to you, Jim? <laughs> well, you know what happened? You went on to be the chairman of the commission. I became a CEO. I'm really protecting the public interest. <laughs> we can debate that later. That's worth a couple drinks. Um, and my answers will be better then, too. <laughs> Let's kind of jump into this. And I'm going to start first, Ron, with you. How will new technologies transform the electric power sector in the future? Thanks for the question. And before I answer it, I want to thank uh, the folks at IEE for putting this on. Um, Lisa Wood. Actually, the name of the event is Powering the People, but I always think of Lisa gets to look at some new toys. Uh, that every year we have this, and a bunch of new technologies come in, and if you know Lisa, you know how excited she gets about this. Anyway, it's good to be here. Um, the question of new technology shaping um, the industry reminds me of the quote from Victor Hugo. Now, this isn't from Les Miserables, which is what he's famous for, and I suspect he's turning in his grave as he watches the movie. Um, but uh, Victor Hugo once said, you can resist an invading army, but you cannot resist an idea whose time has come. 
And it is time that the internet came to the electric power industry. There's no other way of saying it. Uh, all the jokes you've heard about Thomas Edison recognizing blah, 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 you know all of that story. But what we now are on the verge of is a system which will be as transformed as the media, as newspaper delivery, as movie delivery, as music delivery, as communications have been by the internet. Now, usually the examples that are given sound pretty cheesy. You know, people will be able to control their refrigerator while driving their electric car. Uh, that's kind of hard to relate to. But if I w we went back 25 years ago and I told you, Jim, you'd be uh, using your telephone to send text messages to your grandkids, you wouldn't have any idea what I was talking about. And it wouldn't sound like a market. It wouldn't sound very interesting. If I told you, you know, your long your longhand letters were no longer going to be necessary because you'll be communicating using your computer. Now remember, 25 years ago, there weren't PCs. These this wouldn't have been made sense. It's kind of hard to say what the applications are going to be in electricity, but they will be as unusual and it would be hard to make them make sense if we tried to state them today. We're going to have a fabric a network in which all devices are visible to others, talk to each other, communicate prices, all these kinds of things in a very seamless way. And we can't really even imagine that yet. We're still very used to a pretty traditional electric system. Um, as, we, as the panel goes on, I, I'm going to highlight a few technologies that I've been hearing about and reading about, which I think are going to be especially transformative. And just to signal this, uh, I don't believe our regulatory and our um, administrative structures are ready for this. Uh, I feel very strongly. I've been doing a lot of work in this area. Uh, it's usually called new utility business model. I think it really needs to be called new regulatory model because that's where it's going to start. So glad to be on the panel. Uh, glad to uh, um, be cross-examined by you. <laughs> yeah, I only wish I had you under oath. Um, <laughs> I guess, Mike, um, with all your experience in the telecom industry and the changes you saw there, what lessons from the telecom industry do you see that for the power sector? Well, the, the technology question is actually very close. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak to you, um, especially for an outsider who's a telecommunications person more than energy, although I've worked closely with a couple of energy companies. <clears throat> um, over the years that we followed as financial analysts what was happening in technology and telecom, it became obvious that there was a pattern. And the pattern was that technologies changed and it invited in competitors. And so competitors first used them in relatively um, adolescent sort of ways and they became more and more sophisticated over time. And then gradually, um, share was lost by the incumbents, and then uh, it happened that, um, that the regulatory models had to change. And actually, if you stop and you think about the energy industry and the telecom industry, there are rather striking analogous features to them. In telecom, for the last 100 years, uh, it was a near impregnable network built on vast amounts of money that were spent in certain technologies with lines to the homes that people felt could never be replaced satisfactorily by a competitor. And then gradually, and, and also the engineers and the regulators that monitor this industry used to produce very, very thick books. So when I first became an analyst and was following telecom, every year from US West or Bell Atlantic or whoever it happened to be, we get very thick books with metrics so that we could see exactly what was happening in terms of employee productivity. Nobody thought that that network was going to be undone. But technologies began to change first in relatively subtle ways. So there was a 1968 Supreme Court decision that allowed other equipment to be connected to the network. It was the Carter phone decision. So that's when you started having other people's telephones. Tiny little invasive element. And then as time went on, uh, they began to find better and better ways to connect to provide services to the, uh, the business community and they took larger amounts of share and so 
that invasive element almost reminds me of spark grid because there was no way into that impregnable network until suddenly there was an opening that was provided. And then gradually we got to the point of uh, more competition and generally they targeted more profitable sectors. And then finally uh, the regulators began to realize that the systems that were backward looking were no longer working and so remarkable changes have come about and we'll, we'll talk about some of those changes. But technology, in my judgment, was the driver, competition was second, and regulation came tagging along later. It's an interesting sequence, and I think, I suspect that is what we're going to experience. Ron, let me just, I'm going to go through a list of things, and I want you, uh, I'm going to, the question is simply fad or trend. And fad you, or trend? Fad or trend, okay? <laughs> Rooftop solar, fad or trend? A very persistent fad. <laughs> I don't know how to interpret that. I'm not even sure the audience knows how to interpret that. He's a former regulator. <laughs> uh, I, think it's a, I think distributed generation is a trend. Other distributed generation, like CHP, like waste energy. Uh, trend. Uh, the growth in renewable energy at utility scale? That's a very important question. I think it's unsolved. I tend to think it's going to be larger than many of the um, environment, environmentalists do. There's a lot of theory that the distribu distributed generation is going to take over. I think, in fact, uh, most of it is going to be uh, clean energy at the utility scale. So I would say, uh, to your question, a very strong trend. Home energy efficiency devices. I think it's closer to a fad in the sense that I think devices have to get, devices like refrigerators are going to get smarter. But I think having control systems which the consumer actually fiddles with, I don't think that's going to persist. And there's, I think there's evidence of that. You get outfits like Tendril, who started out in that business. They've now moved to platform software business with smart devices interacting instead of the consumer really having a lot of control. I think the consumers will be asked to sort of decide on a profile, much like your cell phone decides if you're going to be quiet or you're going to be active or you're going to be sleep or whatever. You set a bunch of different settings by selecting a profile. I think that's what we're going to see, but I don't think we're going to see a lot of uh, 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 human interaction with control devices in the home. I disagree with you on that Good. one. Just, uh, you're not asking, asking me the question, but what we see on the telecom side, look at the apps on your phone. Who could have ever imagined? So I think that there is more of a movement with computers or phones or telecommunications to want to control things on the edge of the network. And so I guess I will be surprised if those elements don't continue to grow because it's happened in every sector that I've seen. Okay. And we have a new generation of people that are really quite comfortable. That's right. So I'm told. Um, <laughs> well, you should talk to my 11-year-old <laughs> granddaughter. Um, there are trend or fad, tougher appliance and building standards. Oh, it's a very welcome trend. Um, I think um, the appliance standards, um, one, of, one of the outfits that I do some work with is a company called American Efficient, and they've figured out a way, you, your company probably does business with them, Jim. Um, they've figured out a way to actually have consumers learn, find out, and easily reach the most efficient uh, refrigerators or stoves or air conditioning units. And I think, uh, I think that's a very strong trend. Um, and the other option there was building building build, standards. Building standards. That's a tougher one. Um, there's a lot of resistance, as you know. Uh, many states are not even yet to the 2009, much less the 2000 energy codes. I think it's key, but it's a it's a hard uh, it's a hard slog. Let me my turn to you and I think you're right about this telecom being a good analogous industry for us to look at. But as you look at the winners and losers, 
as they went through this transition. Talk to me, who, the, who were the winners and why did they win? The, the answer, Jim, is that it's, it's a bit of a tough thing to be able to explain. I will say that there is a tendency to be backward looking and a very large number of the telephone companies tended to say we understand the engineering, that we've seen so many different changes as we've gone from mechanical to electronic to a digital switching and various things. And so everything tends to be incremental. And, uh, and so this particular set of changes in technologies, as people began attaching to the network and began competing, they felt that by and large we know what we're doing. And so the engineers in-house and the regulators in-house said we have to be backward looking because these metrics have worked for us up to this point in time. The companies that were successful were the ones that tended to image 10, 15, 20 years out. That's really, really difficult because you have the fad and trend discussion here. But Verizon figured out um, probably better than any large company where things were going. Allow me to tell you, in the early 1990s, Verizon was not a well-run wireless company. It was actually one of the poorer companies, but it figured out what was going on, and so was St. Paul falling off the horse. There was a huge conversion that they went through where they began to build up their wireless assets and began to aggregate huge amounts of spectrum and expertise, and they integrated their systems really very well so that their systems were set up properly. And gradually they went through something that with all due deference to Ron and his former profession, uh, Verizon realized that it needed to aggressively become deregulated. So everything that it was doing was going into wireless, and for that matter, even the wireline business with Fios, for those of you who have fiber in your homes, Verizon told the regulators, we're not putting $18 billion into the ground unless you tell us before we do it that you are not going to regulate it. If you tell us you're going to regulate it, we're not doing it. And so Verizon effectively worked out a compact, if you will, to become deregulated. So it believed that market forces and technology were going to change it, and it needed to be freed of any kind of encumbrances. Um, actually, there's a second example that I think is a very, very good company, and it's CenturyLink, and I have a lot of stories there. But they were a relatively small company, two million lines based out of Monroe, Louisiana. Uh, they suddenly realized a number of years ago that the regulation was beginning to move against them, and they had been doing a number of things to prep before that, and they decided to buy Embark, which is the former Sprint local wire, wire line telecommunications operation. Embark was 7 million lines, Century was 2 million lines, and then a year later after buying that, they bought a 13 million line company in Quest. And then two months after the closing of Quest, they bought a $3.2 billion data center operation, which was Savas, global operation. Why did Glenn Post do what he did in that particular case? In my judgment, it was his judgment that he could no longer rely on a regulatory scheme where he was deriving about 20% of his, about 18% of his revenues off of certain regulatory revenues. So he diversified to the point it's low single digits. Glenn, and for that matter, Ivan Seidenberg at, at um, Verizon, realized that they needed to be prepared to deal with a world that was going to be vastly different from the highly regulated industries that they were in, and they needed to remake their business in a way that was customer-centric, not network-centric. So everything they did was to listen to what the customers were asking for, they provided change, and they wanted to be freed of what they considered to be regulatory shackles. So those are the two companies that I think, if you look at what has happened to telecom, there are companies that began to say the regulatory paradigm is not going to be the critical one. The competitive paradigm will be the right model going forward. I was struck by the fact that you characterize the changes coming not next year, five years out, 10 years out, 15 years out. Ron, as you look at the supply side technologies that are evolving as well as the uh, customer side, uh, the productivity gains and the use of those types of technologies, how would you characterize the pace of change or adoption of these technologies? Well, I can give you an answer from my recent experience. 
uh, Excel Energy in Colorado campaigned against the ballot measure in Colorado in 2004 to adopt a state renewable energy standard. It passed over their objections. Two years later, the le four years later, the legislature doubled it from 10 percent to 20 percent, and four years later, from or three years later, from 20 percent to 30 percent. Excel got on board with that. Colorado, if you turn on a light in Denver, one kilowatt hour out of six comes from wind energy in our state. We saw an incredibly fast ramp up to a high level of wind, in our case, and some solar. So I think the pace can be, um, uh, can be rapid. And if you ask the question, what's the distinction between Germany and the United States, or between Mississippi and New Jersey on this. It's policy. It's not resources. It's decisions by legislatures and public utilities commissions and the buy-in of the utilities that makes these policy changes happen. Now, one of the favorite things I've read lately, and I would commend this to everybody here, is a pretty groundbreaking study by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. They just issued a report in late 2012 that shows, I think credibly, that U.S. energy supply by 2050, 80% of it could be provided by wind, solar, biomass, and other renewable technologies. I equate that study to the study that EPRI did in 2007 and 8 when we were first debating in Congress on, on, on uh, carbon legislation, climate legislation. Remember the wedge analysis, the famous EPRI wedge, or prism analysis they call it? This is kind of like a clean energy or a more exactly renewable energy version of it. It's a very compelling document. It shows what you have to go through, what we would have to go through. And probably the most in the bottom line, the punch line, is that the cost of this would not be greater than any other low carbon technology. Now, I happen to be a fan of and supporter of carbon capture and storage. I don't know if it's going to work. You don't, I don't think Duke knows yet if it's going to work. But I think it's something we need to try out. We need to try out lots of solutions. But at least there's now a marker out there that says, if we turned our attention to a clean energy future and went with the, and by the way, there's no heroic assumptions in this about advances in technology. This is kind of what we're doing today. Maybe the turbines on the wind uh, machines won't be fiberglass, but they'll be cloth covered frames. That's the latest advancement there. So you can actually assemble these on site. You ship the parts, you put the blades together, and you stretch a fabric over them. It's, that's the new wind technology. It may, but those are kind of ordinary technologies. So I think the pace could be very rapid. It depends, of course, on the policy. And the policy probably depends more on our decision as a society about whether we're going to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the power sector as well as the other sector. The president seems to be heading in that direction this term. Um, I'm, I'm, rel I'm, I'm relatively hopeful that uh, we will make progress on that. But I think we could turn the corner on this clean energy um, transition more rapidly than many people and maybe many people in this room actually think. Well, you know, the traditional thinking has been if it's clean, it's more expensive. And I think shell gas really changed that because not only was it cleaner, it was cheaper. And the reality is, when we debated in 09 the Waxman-Markey Act, which would have been a policy-driven carbon policy in this country with a price on carbon, the reality is, is that today we have reduced for the power sector 16% reduction in our carbon off 05, and under Waxman-Markey we would have reduced it 17% by 2020. So that's an incredible example of how technology was deployed. Po policy didn't get done, but at the end of the day, the technology actually produced the result. And you Jim, I don't... You seem to be kind of 
b believe that this transition will only happen if it's driven by policy? Well, natural gas is a good example. Uh, it's been called for many years a transition fuel. The industry sort of jettisoned that label lately. It, it seems to be a permanent fuel. On a carbon basis, you hit the wall in 2035 or so with gas. I mean, you do. Um, and it's certainly helping my state, uh, Colorado. We switched 1,000 megawatts of coal to natural gas under my uh, uh, while I was chairman. I think that's a good move. But we also have to understand that without CCS, without carbon capture and storage, I think that's a dead end, a relative dead end. It won't dead end until 2035 or so, but that's when we're going to have to do better on carbon than even natural gas uh, will allow us to do under current assumptions about technology. And Jim, I'll just give you one more data point. I think some of you heard this shot fired around the country, a PPA in New Mexico, less than six cents a kilowatt hour for solar power. Um, so the utility scale solar, and it's, you know, available at peak hours, is getting much cheaper. I hope you're right that a faith in the price of these technologies coming down is enough to uh, have us adopt a clean uh, energy future. And it may be. We've certainly gotten a boost from the natural gas uh, 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 story. Um, I don't know that I think that solar is going to be lower than natural gas when both are on an unsubsidized basis, but we'll, I certainly hope you're right on that. Um, Mike, talk a little bit about how the regulators handle this transition um, and how did they view these changes and their responsibility to, to assure that their regulated telecom company was getting fair returns? I'm going to do that just after I comment on the te technology changes that led to their um, the effect for them. Uh, Ron and I probably represent, I don't want to say stark contrast between what we think the future is going to be, because I don't know your industry as well as you do. But last night I stepped out my outside my home and I went back in and told my wife, I said, it smells like snow. And she said, it's not going to snow tonight. And I went out this morning and there was a dusting of snow out there. Let me tell you something. Photovoltaics smell like wireless to me. Uh, it smells like it because um, in the wireless world, um, we suddenly have a, a bypassing of lines. And photovoltaics, that is distributed energy in that particular case, uh, suddenly makes the impregnable network pregnable. And so what we begin to find is that people are saying it's still too expensive and it may not ever get below shale gas or whatever. I don't know how much shale is out there and I'm not sure that any of us here does. But the reality is AT&T sold all of its wireless spectrum in the late 1980s, for those of you who don't know that history. You know why? They said there's no future, it's going to be too expensive. All of their spectrum they sold. Smart company, no, they were not a smart company. They were never smart. And the, the reality is they made one mistake after another, and that was one of the really classic mistakes that they made. So, and, it, and people in the mid-1990s and late 1990s said, well, wireless is going to hit the ceiling pretty soon because the cost is so high. But the prices fell from 60 cents a minute to 30 cents a minute to 15 cents a minute to just a couple pennies a minute effectively now, and we know where wireless is. So as the price curve begins to hit because people are, are um, uh, incented, changes occur, which goes back to your question, Jim. What has happened? The regulators didn't regulate wireless, really. Um, there was relatively minor light regulatory touch for wireless. And then as this began to happen, the current situation is access lines, phone lines, are being lost by residential customers much more rapidly than we ever could have imagined. So the loss on an annual basis of those lines is around 10%, 12% for uh, residential customers. Business customers are migrating more slowly, and the reason is because they want reliability and security and various other kinds of things. But um, the residential customer is really uh, shedding its uh, dependence upon wireless. Now, what's going to happen in this sector? Photovoltaic costs are going down over 20% a year. 
and we're beginning to see installation that according to Green Tech is going up by, or the demand is going up by at least 50% a year. So what we're beginning to see is more and more incentives for people to figure out how to drive the cost down like it has in other technologies. And that may not mean complete replacement of the energy network that is out there, but that a significant amount of the demand is, is going to go away. And so what will occur is that the regulators are now going to have to try to figure this out. And they've tried to put models into place in order to be able to figure it out. The problem that has occurred with the regulators is this. First, they were paying attention to network metrics more than they were paying attention to the customers. So they continued to look at how fast you answered the telephone, how long your outages were and various other kinds of things. But outages here were much more significant. Drop calls are much more significant. And they didn't realize that the customers were telling them they didn't care about the same metrics. And so the industry continued to change. And then gradually we've reached a point where there's a real crisis right now in telecommunications. And I think it's analogous. The crisis is that the people that can pay more money, that is in urban areas, suburban areas, uh, businesses, are increasingly more efficient in the way in which they're doing things. And then the networks that are in the high cost areas are being set aside. So the recent regulatory for reforms in November 2011, and more recently there have been a number of them, uh, have basically said that the regulators are no longer going to provide the same kind of support for the high cost networks that are outside of the urban areas. The issue is that the regulators don't understand the financial model and suddenly we're going to have wastelands in terms of telecommunications. If I were to draw some sort of analogy to your area, I think the changes that we saw in telecom that took 15 or 20 years probably will happen faster because technologies are more sophisticated today and people understand the pattern in, in the investment community and they understand it in the technology centers of, of the world and they're going to make those changes and then the regulators are going to have to try to figure it out. But the regulators who have, have been backward looking and don't have long tenures on their, on their commissions, they don't have the wherewithal to figure it out. And so what's going to happen is the models will disintegrate. I will tell you in telecom, they've disintegrated already. That's Jim, I think you may know, I've been doing a lot of work in this area of utility business models. And my conclusion, really, is that few of us have any business trying to decide what utilities should look like as entities themselves. What we should focus on instead is the regulatory regime in which they're acting and let them figure out what the adaptations need to be. Um, I, I, the one, one way of saying it is that in other parts of the world, Great Britain in particular, they pay attention to what they're getting for the rates they pay. It's sort of an output-based focus. Here, we're focused on how much we're we paying for what we get. And all of this focus of utility commissions on the costs of that misses the big picture. Uh, I have been speaking a lot and uh, writing some papers on this uh, along the lines that we need to move to a more output based. In other words, name what the targets are. And I think actually, Jim, you um, at Duke have done some of this, especially with some of your proposals on energy efficiency. What do we want to get out of this? And my preference is not to regulate prices on the basis of cost, but on the basis of uh, sort of a price cap sort of regime in which, as we did in telecom, and you remember this very well, when competition began making costs of service a, a much uh, hard to come, hard thing to grasp, we moved to a price cap. I think it's about time we start looking at that in telecom. Give the utilities, the distribution companies, a trajectory of what their prices are going to look at, look like over the next five, eight years. Let them work on that. Let them squeeze the efficiencies out of their companies because that will go to their bottom line hold them to some output goals. It may be percentage of renewables, it may be reductions in carbon, it may be customer complaint levels, reliability. You can make that up as we can make up our own list. But state regulation really needs to step up at this point. I think state regulation, much like Mike just said, could be standing in the way instead of leading the way. That's an interesting observation. As you were talking, I was sitting here thinking about 
we just completed a $9 billion generation modernization plan that's going to allow us to close 7,000 megawatts of old coal plants. And I look up at the lights, pretend these were in Charlotte, and I'm a customer, and the lights are the same as they were before I sent the $9 billion. Yet the air is cleaner because I'm producing electricity from five gas combined cycle plants, two advanced coal plants that are supercritical pulverized coal and coal gas. And so in a performance system, customers can't see the value and you can't price in the value of the cleaner air. And so as I thought about your comments, it would be pretty difficult to have a price cap, particularly when you might be making changes to modernize your system. Let, let me, that well, was a comment, it, it, but let, let, it let me. It depends on what the price cap, I, I'm not talking about a lid, I'm not talking about a, I'm talking about a increasing price over time. I mean, it could be inflation or something like that. Let me, let me shift a little bit, because we've been on solar pretty hard, and I tend to agree with this conversation. I think it's gonna come faster than most people believe. I like to use the analogy, and I think our industry needs to use the analogy that it's the, all of y'all have heard this, if you put a frog in a boiling pot of water, it'll jump right out. I think our industry is a frog that's in that cold pot of water that's sitting on the stove and they're turning up the degrees, both on the supply side with solar and on the demand side. But I actually think, and Ron, this is for you, I th what's your view about how fast the adoption of new technologies are on the customer side? Do you have a sense of read into that? Will, that ha will the de fall in demand be faster than the growth in the supply not owned by the utility? That's a, there's several questions buried in that one. Let me just, let me make a couple points. One is that we have, after four and a half billion dollars of investment from the uh, Recovery Act, uh, people are all asking the question, what next? W where is the smart grid going? And it appears to have stalled out, stalled out in the sense that you've got a lot of smart meters and a lot of houses and they're not doing much more except rendering monthly bills, just like they used to. The ingredient that's missing is smart prices. I don't know if Rick Morgan is still in the audience. There he is. Rick said famously, it doesn't work to have smart meters if you have dumb prices. And I think it's time to make prices smarter. One thing that I really challenge state regulators to do is to look at maybe not a hour by hour dynamic price, real time pricing, but at least a time of use price, which shows a peak period during the day and off peak prices. And I think customers will begin to respond to that. It will make electric vehicles more valuable. We already heard this morning about the value of, or this afternoon earlier, about the value of electric vehicles. Well, if you're dropping prices to marginal costs in the nighttime, they become even more valuable. I think that customers are willing to do things. Uh, I'll, I'll cite an example from Colorado. Uh, Excel Energy has 160,000 customers who allow their, their uh, air conditioning to be interrupted during critical peak times. For that, they get paid $40 a year. That's the basis for uh, signing up for it. You don't notice it. I think all of you who have this service know. You don't really see it happen. It just the utility saves money when they interrupt your compressor. Why would we not do that with refrigerators and hot water heaters? There's nothing fundamentally different about the interruption of a device like an air conditioner uh, uh, with the interruption of a water heater or, um, uh, or the car battery, you heard about that this morning, um, or the freezer. So I, I'm actually encouraged because of the way we've seen people respond to opportunities and options in internet and in information services. I think customers are getting more sophisticated and I think they will go along with a lot of the uh, smart grid sort of things once we get prices fixed. 
I think that needs to be a priority. I don't think you have to do it to all the customers. It's really not. The smallest customers aren't that interesting when it comes to these kinds of devices. They just aren't big enough to collectively make that much difference. But for customers who have demands in the 1,500 kilowatt hours a month and above, things like that, they should be very interesting customers for this. So I think with um, leadership from states on pricing, and I think with utilities who are sort of willing uh, to embrace a new future where the, um, the grid is smarter and their customers are, and, and, the, and the utility is more of the orchestrator, no longer the end-to-end -end service provider, but more of the orchestrator, I think we can actually see a, a, a relatively rapid move in technology on that front. Do you, do you, and I'm going to follow up with you, Ron, and then come back to Mike. Is it the utility that's deploying the devices within the home, or is it a third-party unregulated entity in your vision of the I future? I think it will be both, and I think, it, I, I think the, um, I, 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 as a regulator, I favor the utility having that option to involve, be involved. They're a trusted partner for most customers, and I think it, we would be, as a society, we would really squander a big resource if we kept the utilities out of this. That said, I was one of the regulators in this country who said to Excel, you're doing uh, a lot of uh, great uh, load management with your interruptible program, but we want you to contract with somebody and end up being Interknock. So I think there's plenty of opportunities for others to get in this, even in the, uh, the vertically integrated traditional markets, which we both know a lot about. Um, it gets more complicated when you've got retail competition and, 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 and even wholesale competition makes it much more complicated. But I think, um, I think it'll be a combination of both utilities and the service providers. And it will break, I mean, Mike knows all about this from telecom. There was a, there's still a reservoir of goodwill for the old incumbents and they make a market of it. But there's also plenty of new actors. And I don't see any reason, fundamental reason, the electricity industry can't support that structure as well. Mike, describe the balance in the telecom industry, because I kind of see it as the old incumbents are pretty much out of business. Well, there have been rather significant changes. I, I want to talk as a financial analyst. Okay. And Jim, you, you go and talk to investors, Bob Rowe and various other people. You talk to investors. I talk to uh, Fidelity Funds and, and Alliance and Putnam and American Express and all those companies out there, and they all want to know, is there going to be growth? And what are the margins going to look like? And how predictable is it? And your industry is extremely important for the predictability and the sustainability of the dividends and things like that. In telecom, what happened was new services began to emerge, and those services were significantly wireless. And the growth, as I indicated, proved to be explosive and far more so than people expected it to be. So there was top line growth that was unregulated and people said, this is a great opportunity to, to invest. And they began to also look at broadband. So the demand for broadband was, was heroic for a significant period of time and it continues to be very, very good right now, including on, on your wireless phone. So there was a top line driver where there was not some sort of control on the rate of return that you, you generated. In your case, in the energy industry, if I understand it correctly, and Jim, you were talking about um, sub 1% growth for the foreseeable future, and I've seen EEI's estimates and various others, they're talking at most 1%. Suppose competition comes in, and this is where I don't as much care about green energy and those kinds of things affecting the industry as much as I care about technology change. If technology change begins to come in and distributed energy takes away that 0.4% growth, then the investors are going to get very, very nervous. And they're going to be watching cash flow margins, especially in an environment where costs are going up higher, where there's the carbon recapture and all those kinds of things. And they're going to start worrying about the dividends. In the telecom space right now, the great worry is that the dividend generating industry that was incumbent telephone companies is beginning to be pressured and so there's more flight from the industry. So the incumbents have had trouble although they've had a, some element of growth by virtue of broadband and wireless 
and certain other types of services, data center services, which have continued to grow, the cloud and things like that. So there's a way out for the telecom industry. I don't know, and your, your industry has a dynamic that is so foreign to me, that is the regulators want what? They want rates to stay the same and they want demand to go lower and lower with demand response and things like that. For an investor, that's scary. <laughs> And it's scary, especially with rising costs associated with it. So if I were talking to you as a financial analyst who published on your sector, that would make me very, very spooked going forward because I see the cost of capital rising. And if the regulators begin to lose control, I see the risk factors continue to rise. So more than green energy and other things, I think you need to monitor the appetite of the customers for change, especially with fundamental technology changes that we're beginning to see because I do believe that on the edge, the customers are going to want to migrate to alternative distributed technologies, and they were going to want to control their networks more and more going forward once they become more sophisticated, and I think it's going to happen fast. But this, this is a case, electric utilities, are you in the railroad business or are you in the transportation business? That is That's correct. That's the question. And your example of decreasing sales, you mean by that, I assume, kilowatt hours, okay? That's not, what, that's not what customers are seeing on their end. They're actually seeing a growth in services. They're just being done more efficiently, more, less intensively with respect to the amount of energy. A refrigerator today, you know what the average around the clock load of a refrigerator is today? It's under 100 watts, okay? It's about the same as a light bulb. This is to have a freezer and refrigerator and ice maker and everything else. The fundamental change that's occurring, the reason why EEI's projection for lower uh, growth is because of the efficiencies that the, that the U.S. economy are undertaking with respect to their electricity. It's not that they're using less electricity just to be using less electricity. They're getting more out of it and using less. So, so now I've got the question for you, Mr. Regulator, Mr. Chairman. You want to encourage me to drive down my energy sales, and all these things are do, going on to drive down my energy sales. So I, I'm guessing, because you want me to have a fair return on the investment, to stand to, to back up the guy that's got solar on the rooftop and clouds come in or it rains like hell or you know, whatever. And so I'm betting that you support a fixed variable rate. <laughs> so I get all my fixed costs back and they're allocated to all the customers. Or you're so enlightened that you will even adopt maybe a formula rate that effectively gets all my fixed costs back regardless of my sales. Are you there? Uh, I'm actually uh, close. <laughs> Come with me. <laughs> <laughs> And this is being taped. <laughs> yeah, I, I, real, I realize that. I, I was trying to decide whether to make a Hugo Chavez joke. I think I won't. Um, <laughs> um, Jim, you, you, you did a magnificent job of laying out uh, incompatible choices. So let me see if I can work on that. Uh, no, I, I actually, I do think that the way in which utilities are compensated and what they do or what they are said to be doing has got to change, absolutely. And you talk about a formula rate. Um, I have never embraced decoupling as just a Band-Aid on top of cost of service regulation. But if you read some of the things I've written and, and others working in this area, we do, um, I do, um, prefer a, a metric for the utility that measures the outputs, the services that customers get, as opposed to the kilowatt hours. It would be a revenue cap, if you want to put it in those terms, instead of a rate of return cap. And it would be pricing, which would be independent of the volume. So yes, I agree. I think that's where we're headed. I mean, I, I don't think we're in a crisis situation, but I think regulators have to step up their games, and I, I will include myself in the ranks. I tried to do a lot of stuff as a state regulator. It was a tough place to, to, to be innovative. I, I agree with that, but I think, uh, I think we're all coming around to the consensus that the new, new utility business model is absolutely required and a predicate for that will be a regulatory environment in which utilities actually can develop that model. 
God, I love that answer because let, let me kind of, Mike, put a question to you now. You're a financial analyst, I mean, in right. your earlier life. And as a financial analyst in our industry, the more regulated you are, the higher your PE is. Because the more- If they're good regulators. Yeah, th 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 that's why we have six different states and diversity of regulation makes, because at any moment you can have rogue regulators. And if you're just in one state, it's a bad day. It doesn't often happen. <laughs> yeah, no, not often. Um, but my qu today, in, in this environment, the more regulated you are, higher percentage of regulation, assuming good regulatory jurisdictions, you get a higher PE. Right. So your stock trades better and you're able to grow, attract capital Correct. at a lower cost. The, what, what happens to utilities that are sitting in that world with a high PE and they see all the guys come in to build solar on the rooftop of their customers and they see all these new technologies reducing their load. If, I, if my response is a telecom response, what I would do is I would start a company to put solar on the rooftop. And I'd go out and put solar on the rooftop of every other utility um, and, and, until I got really good. And then I put it on, on, the, on our customers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> small joke. Um, and, 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 but then what I'd do is I'd start a company, kind of a, the ESCOs of the old days went directly into the ditch in the late 90s because they couldn't figure out a way to make money. So I'd start up an ESCO and I'd take all these new technologies and I'd go into homes and say, and we've done this. I mean, we've done a, in South Charlotte, we took 100 homes and we put sensing devices between refrigerators and dishwashers. And when somebody turns a dishwasher on, it sends a signal to the refrigerator, the re refrigerator cycles down, then the dishwasher comes on. And, and then when it finishes, it sends a signal back. We've reduced demand on the peak 20% without the customer seeing any difference in the quality of service. So I would say that I need to get in that business because guess what? My regulators are not going to give me the same return on every dollar I invest in energy efficiency because I can invest a dollar in nuclear and earn more. They won't give me the same return on energy efficiency. They won't give me the same. And so as a consequence, I need to start a company and start to be in that business. Now, you're an analyst and I've got a high PE because I'm 90% regulated. But I need to change that from 90% regulated to 70% regulated because I need to build all these solar on the rooftop. I need to go to all these homes and reduce their usage 20 to 30% on the peak. Are you gonna keep my PE high? If I'm preparing for a world I see 10 years from now or 15 years from now, or are you just going to let me sit there in the pot and let them turn the heat up on me and all of a sudden the value of my company, I can't jump out. Well, there are interesting case, well, I don't know if there are case studies out there, but I can tell you that a number of the companies that are most forward looking had to go through times when their PEs contracted. So in telecom, Verizon got murdered when it started making its Fios investment, murdered because of the cash flows associated with it. And also, when they began going into business that, businesses that were perceived as being riskier, there's no question there was a contraction. So you have to take a longer term view. So your stock may be under pressure while people feel that the risk is growing. And you have to take that, that longer term view in order to be able to do it. The other longer term view that I think that you need to do that telecom did very inadequately is that you've got to reg educate your regulators and you have to educate them way ahead of time as to the financial consequences of what's happening because they need to understand that if they put in place systems that really are problematic for the longer term in terms of your customer base, we, we talked about the zero energy situation. In the zero energy situation, you're, you're obviously incenting certain people who can afford it to put um, technologies into place where effectively the costs are offloaded onto other parts of the network. And in that particular case, you, I think you need to educate the regulators as to what's going to happen five or 10 years out, that it's going to be an untenable solution in that case. 
we went through that and a number of things that I could bore you with on telecom, which any third grader could have figured out was going to not work out. And I can tell you, I wrote about it 10, 15 years ago, that they were insane policies. And they came to the end that anyone could have predicted. It's not because I was smart. It was because it was so obvious. But in those particular cases, it was a backward looking view by the regulators and a politically expedient set of decisions that they made. And I think that there are politi politically expedient decisions that are being made here that make no real sense from a financial point of view. So if I were to go back in time to counsel the telecom companies better, it would be be rigorous and fight like the Dickens to provide some sort of long-term view for the regulators about what's going to come. Because in your case, the regulators are important for the uh, overall value of your company and it is going to be different from telecom but the regulators have to be smart and better, under, uh, better understand the import of what they're doing. But I do think that there are going to be PE hits while you diversify. And Verizon's a really good example. They traded below AT&T for a period of time, and they've come back because people now see the sense of what they've done far better than what its competitor has done. Ron, let me ask each of y'all to make one last comment. I mean, if there's going to be one message that people walk out of this room with in terms of the role of technology in our sector and what message do you want people to have? I'm going to uh, relate a couple things. One of my clients is Dow Solar. They're producing a roofing shingle with thin film solar baked into the shingle, you nail them down with galvanized nails and hammers, you plug them together, row across row, jump up to the next row, you get a solar roof. It's your shingle, it's guaranteed by Dow, this isn't a commercial, it's guaranteed by Dow for 20 years. Those are being installed now in subdivisions in Colorado, as if they were just roofs. The electric utility industry I think is beginning to understand how big the challenge to them is. I think it's time for a new grand bargain between regulators and utilities. I am pro-competitive where that works, but we're going to have a network, and this is what we've really been talking about, necessary to keep all the pieces talking to each other, working economically and efficiently. That's a must-have. Society must have that. It's time to restructure the bargain that regulators and utilities are operating under, one that looks forward to these immense challenges that technology are bringing in the industry. My quote. I would say I smelled snow last night and it snowed, and I smell technology changes in this industry. I don't think that the regulators are going to control it. I think you have to run your businesses assuming that pretty significant technology changes are coming and it's going to change the entire competitive paradigm in, in your industry and the financial model that you've known for the last 100 years about which you are justifiably proud is about to change. And you need to really have a longer term view and that will mean sometimes dealing with your stock price being under some pressure. That's partially going to mean educating your regulators but I assume that the regulators are not going to control the paradigm. Technology will, and comp competitors coming in will, and you need to discern, discern that pattern as far out as you possibly can. I think you probably have six, seven, ten years to figure it out. But I think it's going to change much faster than telecom changed, and I think it's going to be a very, very significant change in the underlying financial model that you've known, and your access to capital for that matter. I'd like for y'all to join me in thanking Mike and Ron for their provocative and thoughtful comments. You too, Jim. You too, Jim.